Namaste. Let's look into the wonderful 10th verse of Sri Shiva Sahasranama. Aum Kubera Bandhu Sri Kanto Lokavarno Tamo Mriduhu Samadhi Vedya Kodangdi Nilakanta Parashvadhihi so Kubera Bandhu, he's the friend of Kubera. Now, Kubera's story is very interesting. It's narrated in Shiva Purana series about how the rascal fallen son of a Brahmana, who was rejected by his family and became a vagabond, tried to steal the offerings <laughs> from a Shiva temple. And because of that, he was killed. But in the process of trying to steal, he lit a lamp in the inner sanctum of the temple, illuminating the lingam, which had been sitting in the dark. Everybody was asleep. The lamp had gone out. So when he lit it, the pious credit that he earned from that, after death, instead of you know, being dragged off by the Yamadutas and sent to hell for his offenses, he went to Shivaloka. So after spending a nice long time in Shivaloka, he returned to the earth where he was a pious king. And his thing was keep the lamps burning in Shiva's temple 24 hours a day. And in those days, of course, they used ghee lamps. So, you know, this was a significant expense for the kingdom. But because of the pious credits earned by that devotional service, he was undefeatable. He remained king, and his kingdom was stable and prosperous his whole life. Then again he went back to Shivaloka, and Shiva made him the treasurer of the demigods, really of the whole universe, Kubera, and made him his special friend. Uh, he gave him even a mountain near Kailash. So, Kubera, every time you go to a big Shiva temple in India, there's a temple of Kubera nearby on a hill. That's always the setup because Kubera is, you know, bosom buddies with Shiva. He's in the rasa of friendship. So the two enjoy a wonderful friendship, which is going to last, you know, for the rest of the duration of the universe. Kubera Bandhu. That's Shiva. Next. Shri Kanta. Shri Kanta means of a beautiful neck. We've already been through the story of how Shiva drank the Kalakata poison at the beginning of the universe when the ocean of milk, the causal ocean, was being churned by the Mount Mandara. So Mount Mandara is really like the sum total of all the solids in the universe, and the causal ocean is like the sum total of all the liquid in the universe. And really, it's all part of Sri Vishnu's wealth. Vishnu's wealth is that he is the master, he is the lord, he is the possessor, the owner of all the material in the universe. Earth, water, fire, air, and what we would call space. Now, which in those days was called Akash. So these material elements, and Akash is a material element, even though it's subtle, it gives room for everything else to exist. Huh? So uh, this kind of room, empty space, frictionless empty space, is only necessary when you have a material creation. 
because when you have only a mental creation or spiritual creation, those forms don't require space. See, like if you ask, where are your dreams? When you go into Swapna consciousness, where are you? Well, you can't really ascribe a location to it, can you? I mean, you could say it's in my head, but that's, <laughs> that's a Jagrat point of view. From the point of view of dream consciousness itself, you could be anywhere or nowhere. It's irrelevant. The question is impossible. So when we're in dreams, it doesn't matter where we are because whatever we're seeing or experiencing in dreams is just, uh, you know, digesting the impressions we've had during the day. So the location doesn't really matter. See? Space means location. It means dimension. It means a certain volume of emptiness, of nothingness. And so space is just as much of a material element as anything else. Because without space, of course, nothing can exist. Nothing material, anyway. Okay, so then... I love this word, loka varnotama. Loka varnotama, this is a deep one. Loka, of course, means worlds, or the world, or the earth. Varna means color, really at the root, but it also means caste in the sense of a social or racial or cultural group. Uh, and, of course, the four varnas of the Vedic culture are Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaisha, and Shudra, or uh, sadhus, not those who are making efforts for enlightenment, kings, merchants, and workers. So, obviously, the workers are the most numerous. They're about 95% of society. And then the people who uh, use money, the three higher castes, the merchants, kings, and the brahmanas, they get the sacred thread. They get the Gayatri mantra. They're known as Dvija, born again, reborn, because the power of the Gayatri mantra is to give you birth in heaven. Try it. You'll see. But you have to chant it like from the moment you wake up in the morning until you go to sleep at night. That's how it works. And when it works like that, it's very quick, only a couple of weeks. But you'll get the result if you're, you know, living like a sadhu. <laughs> okay. But in this case, because we're talking about Shiva, I don't think we're talking about the castes. Now, the, the translation given in the book is the most excellent of all the castes in the world. I don't think that's right. Why should Shiva even be considered to have a caste? You know? Is he uh, a part of the social structure, the social milieu of Vedic culture? No, he's beyond all that. He's beyond even being and non-being. So how could he be a member of any caste, you know, even the highest caste imaginable? So this is not a proper translation, I do. The, the castes, four castes refer to the Pashu. They refer to the livestock. <laughs> the two-legged animals. <laughs> but those who are realized are beyond caste. Uh, someone like Ramana Maharshi, good example, he is not subject to the normal rules of caste. He can do whatever he wants because he's enlightened. Uh, he doesn't have to restrict his activities or his beingness, more importantly, to conform to some social rules and regulations. And he didn't. <laughs> but that's another subject. Uh, what we're really talking about here, I think, a varna can also be the external appearance of something. It can also mean the explanation 
or the reason for something. So, loka varna could also mean that Shiva is or gives or is the source of the appearances of all the different worlds. That's more fitting, I think, with the idea that Shiva is the absolute. And Uttama, of course, means the highest. So he is the highest. I also came across, oh, there's a word, Goloka Varnana, which is in a work about Shiva, which I haven't read. It's kind of obscure. Uh, the Goloka Shiva Sanghita. Goloka Shiva, I have no idea what that means. Well, it means the planet of the cows, huh? See, in Vedic culture, you don't have stupid things like the planet of the apes. You have the planet of the cows <laughs> or the cow planet that the earth itself is sometimes represented as a cow. And, of course, Shiva's uh, symbol is the bull, and his vehicle is also a bull, Nandi. So, anyway, I think it's much more likely that this is the, uh, Shiva is like, the outward appearance or the explanation or the reason for the highest worlds. Next, mridu. Mridu means soft. That's really all it means. He's soft. Now, some people experience Shiva as very hard. And certainly, uh, one of the meanings of mridu is Saturn. And Saturn can be very hard. But, Shiva's discipline, Shiva's hardness, is only to bring about surrender or softness, which is another meaning of mridu. So he is very soft with his friends and lovers. He's very kind, very compassionate and soft, mridu. And then this kind of belongs with the next one, samadhi vedya, who can be realized through trance. Samadhi, of course, is when one enters sushupti consciousness with awareness. Most of the time we're in sushupti during sleep, and there's no awareness, no idea what we're doing there, <laughs> what it all means. Uh, but when we enter sushupti, as the Buddha instructed, uh, by a progressive series of more and more empty-minded states, where one is nothing, is becoming nothing, does nothing, owns nothing, uh, is trying to do nothing. Huh? Well, these kind of meditations or jhanas were taught by the Buddha, and this is a standard part of Raj Yoga. So, one who is on that path of samadhi is in a position to get Veda, or knowledge, of Shiva. Samadhi Veda. Kodandin, he's holding a bow. Huh? He, ko is a preposition, and Nandin is, uh, Dandin is, is really a weapon, a generic term for weapon. Nilakanta, again, blue-necked, from his swallowing the poison, at the beginning of the universe, and Parashvadin, holding an axe. Now that sounds like Parashuram. Parashuram, of course, was an incarnation, nominally an incarnation of Vishnu, and he uh, annihilated the whole Kshatriya caste 21 times with his axe because his father was murdered by kshatriyas and stabbed 21 times. So that was his, their, or that was their reaction, that Vishnu himself came to avenge his father's death. And so whereas there is Vishnu, there is also Shiva. Where there is Shiva, there is also Vishnu. <laughs> the two of them are just different faces, different bodies or different manifestations of the same being, which is Brahman, the infinite, the inconceivable, the absolute. Aung Tatsat, 
ओम शक्ति ओम ओम नमः शिवाय